You know, one of the things that Paul talked about in First Corinthians is that you've got 10,000 instructors, but sure. you don't have any fathers. Yeah. You get fathers and mothers in the local church, mm -hmm. and that's what you get in a true discipleship environment. To put knowledge before virtue actually interrupts one's ability to receive in a genuine and meaningful way the value of Scripture and, and the meaning that it holds. If you make disciples indeed, you'll get church members. Mm -hmm. But if you're making church members, you're not going to get disciples indeed out of that. Hi, I'm Brandon Briscoe, and welcome to The Postscript, Living Faith Bible Institute's weekly podcast and YouTube series devoted to interviewing pastors and professors from LFBI and across the Living Faith Fellowship. The Living Faith Bible Institute holds to a biblical philosophy of discipleship. And what we mean by that is that we believe that the most biblical method of discipleship looks like what Jesus Christ offered his disciples and what Paul offered Timothy or Titus, and that is specifically an up-close and personal form of mentorship, where a mature believer invests biblical doctrine and biblical per, uh, principles and biblical perspectives and a biblical lifestyle into the life of a younger believer. Uh, we don't believe that discipleship is a program or a lesson book or an app uh, like many people would probably suggest. Uh, we don't actually believe that Sunday school or small groups are sufficient for the level of personal transformation that discipleship requires. For decades now, the churches in the Living Faith Fellowship have taken this particular discipleship approach very, very seriously, allocating people and resources to make it a ministry priority within their local churches. And, and because they've done that, that's resulted in more mature ministers, it's resulted in greater biblical proficiency within those ministers, and it's resulted in greater character and personal maturity within the people in their churches. We believe the results in these churches speak for themselves, and over the years, many pastors have actually reached out to LFBI to request help with how to implement biblical discipleship within their local churches. And we've been glad to field those conversations, and we've, we've been glad to, to, to help and make an investment into those churches and into those pastors. But with all of that in mind, the Living Faith Bible Institute decided that we would develop an online resource to help pastors get a hold on what discipleship is and what is required to make it effective. And so with that, I want to show you a brief clip from Discipleship Central, uh, which is the website that we've developed. I want to show you a clip uh, that would help inform our conversation today. The focus of the Living Faith Bible Institute is to equip students to make disciples of Jesus Christ all around the world. And as many students continue to join our school from a variety of churches, we've come to identify the need to develop a resource to help churches develop and implement a biblical discipleship ministry in their local church. That resource is Discipleship Central. Our aim is going to be to provide pastors and leaders in their local churches with the tools, the training, and support that they need to make disciples indeed. Today, I've invited chair of the Foundations Program at LFBI and discipleship pastor at Midtown Baptist Temple, Pastor Kenny Morgan, to share with us about Discipleship Central and why this tool will help pastors and leaders to advance a discipleship model within their churches. And so with that, my dear friend, Pastor Kenny Morgan, man. Hey, what's up? It's good to have you on the show. It's good to be back. This is one of the areas of ministry that you have been just really devoted to over the last year. You've taken Discipleship Central um, as one of your your primary focuses in ministry, because you really have a heart for this, and so I, I want I want that to be expressed in our episode today. And so I want to begin by by asking you um, personally, because I know this is something you're passionate about. What makes someone a disciple of Jesus Christ? Yeah. What I mean, the word disciple gets thrown around a lot. It's a biblical word. There's lots of biblical words get abused, and mm. um, they're the definitions become abstracted over time. When we look at the scriptures and in terms of, of how you understand them, 
Um, what makes someone a disciple of Jesus Christ? Yeah, I appreciate the question because it seems like when we're having this conversation about discipleship and when we're trying to define it, 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 it turns very subjective. So it, it becomes, well, whatever I think or whatever this group says it ought to be or whatever. Right. Versus actually, well, let's just see what the Bible says mm -hmm. about it. And it's both simple, and but then also I would say somewhat complex to define just because of how vast of yeah. a topic it is right. and the attention that the Word of God gives to it, Genesis to Revelation. So how do you define something like that? Mm. But I do believe that a very safe place to go if we're looking to define what, what makes a disciple of Jesus Christ is found in John chapter 8. Mm -hmm. And in this chapter, you find Jesus once again in a situation where he's having this discourse over who he is with the religious leaders of Israel. And of course, one of the things he says in that great chapter is, I am the light of the world. Yeah, And so right. you keep going down the, the line from, from verse 12 with that, and you land in, in verse 31, where you realize now that there was a response from some of the Jews that were hearing this, and the response was they believed on him. Mm -hmm. And so today we would liken that to a profession of faith. Right. But it's almost like when you read that, it's like he didn't take a breath. <laughs> Jesus went from you know, their profession of faith to now talking about this issue of discipleship. Yeah. And he talks about it conditionally. Now, it's very important to point out that he wasn't talking about salvation. Mm -hmm. They had just made that profession of faith. So now the conditional statement that he adds to that response was, if mm. ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. Mm. But then verse 31, it doesn't end with a period, it ends in a semicolon, which means the thought in verse 32 is a continuation or is connected to the thought of verse 31, which now he's talking about discipleship. And now from there he says, you continue in his word, then now you're his disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth and it makes you free. Mm. So this is the only time in scripture that we see this phrase, disciples indeed. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't mean that it's insignificant because we're talking about a believer who is continuing in the word of God mm -hmm. after salvation right? You're going to know the truth and it's going to make you free. So one of the clear signs or evidences or proofs of a disciple indeed is that you're going to see freedom. Mm -hmm. and, and this is one of the ways that a church can really know and discern biblically if they're making disciples is when you see people experience freedom in Christ from things that they were in bondage to in the world. Mm -hmm. So when we're trying to pinpoint or define or identify, okay, what's a, who's a disciple of Jesus Christ? I think you're gonna see those two things. Yeah. You're gonna see them continue in the word of God beyond the gospel, and you're going to see them live a life of freedom from the bondage of the world that they've been delivered from. Yeah, I like that as an evidence. That makes a lot of sense. So a, a, a pastor, uh, a member of a church, might know how effective they are at making disciples based on whether or not people are stuck in cycles of sin yeah. that they're not getting freedom over. And so if a pastor finds himself constantly counseling terrible situations, if the, the church itself looks like the community outside of the four walls of, of the congregation and, and, and the world has taken, uh, you know, believers, people who've been set free by the grace of Jesus Christ right. and, and made them um, bond servants once again, uh, that's, a, that's problematic and it's probably a sign that you're not headed the right direction. Correct. I also think about that idea about freedom also having a lot to do with liberty and ministry. And I think a really fair way of asking yourself whether or not you're effective at making disciples in your church is whether or not people have freedom to do ministry or if they're expecting their leadership to do it. If they're looking to the, to the leadership of their church to basically supply all of the volunteer hours and all of the right. work and, and that they're the ones that are responsible for the Great Commission, well, that's not a liberated church. That's a church that's, that's in bondage to presuppositions that are not biblical. And so I think that I think those are really good assessments. And and so you know obviously we've kind of grown up in the faith, mm -hmm. hearing about discipleship and and holding to a very particular approach to 
to what discipleship means. And we've seen the fruit of it. I mean, mm. we really truly have. Maybe just personally share with us before we get into the meat and potatoes, could you share with us why the mandate to make disciples is so important to you personally? Because you really have, as a discipleship pastor, um, you've given your whole life and attention to this topic. What, why are you motivated to do that? Like, why is that so important to you as a minister? Yeah. So from a leadership perspective, you know, when, it, you know, from, from the, the perspective that we have and hold as pastors who've been entrusted with the tall order of making full proof of the ministry that God has entrusted to us, it's very clear to us. It's very clear to me all the time that as a church, we can do a million things very, very well. But if we fail to make disciples indeed for the glory of God, then ultimately we felt. Mm -hmm. it, this, making disciples indeed is the ultimate measure of success for any local church. If we're doing a million things great, but doing that very poorly, then in the words of my pastor, I think what we're actually doing is we're just playing church. Mm -hmm. I mean, that making disciples is ultimately what brings God glory. And you say, well, man, how do you justify that? Well, to me, I think it's pretty clear. And I think it's, I think it's biblically simple because I think you see this early on in the book of Genesis there in chapter one. God's heart was to see not just his likeness, but it was to see his image, his mm -hmm. likeness and his image, right? Reproduced in humanity. And he wanted to see planet earth populated with human beings who bore his image and likeness. Yeah. That's what God was after. And he's still after that. And of mm -hmm. course, now in Christ, when we're saved, we get that image back. Right. We get it back in Christ. And so what is it that's going to bring God glory in his church? It is to see men and women who are being conformed to the image of his son. Mm -hmm. If people aren't becoming more like Christ in thought, speech, and behavior, then what are we doing? Yeah. And so ultimately, it doesn't matter how many people are coming. If we're growing numerically and we're, we're building facilities and our operating budget is increasing and, you know, I guess we're the, the hot church in town, uh, if, if that church uh, before God looks like the church at Corinth, Mm. then what are we doing? <laughs> yeah, it's an illusion. It is, mm -hmm. right? And so what actually pleases God is to see men and women who are like his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. That is where God's going to get the most glory, which is why we, we read what we read in John 15, chapter 8. How is it that God is glorified? It's when we bear much fruit. Mm -hmm. it's, it's the fruit that we bear, and particularly the fruit that looks like his son in his people. Yeah. So that that's why for me it's everything. I, I I look at our church. I when I look at people and I look at I obviously see the numbers and I see people taking the classes and doing all those things and moving through the process that we have in place. But nothing will encourage you like having a conversation with someone. And I can name people. You you know these people. I know mm -hmm. these people. Where we remember who they were yeah. from day one. And now here we are a year and a half, two years later, and you're having a conversation and it's obvious. Mm -hmm. It's obvious that they are thinking, speaking, and walking more like Christ. Yeah, there's Praise nothing God. like it. Yeah. There's not a pastor who doesn't probably want that mm -hmm. if they have a heart for God's word. Because they recognize that, that this is this is the this is the mandate. This right. is the mission is to establish people and uh, and strengthen them in God's word, that their roots would grow deep and that they would be ultimately would be fruitful. With that in mind, how did you come to a place where you were convinced that we needed to develop Discipleship Central? I would say it was the uh, kind of uh, a step in what's been a journey over the years of fielding a number of inquiries mm -hmm. from pastors and churches literally all over the the, the world, mm -hmm. where they're asking questions and they're, they're trying to get help with discipleship, looking for support, looking for answers. 
it, it seems like, and it kind of goes back to the, the question that you asked about, so what makes a disciple of Jesus Christ? And and the, the question that many pastors and leaders are entertaining is very similar to that. What's discipleship? How mm -hmm. do you do it? How do you implement it? I came to the place that, hey, I think we need a, a central place for people to come. So if you're that LFBI student or you've befriended someone in our church about discipleship and you want us to talk to your pastor, hey, here's a place that you can route your pastor. You can route leaders. You can route other people to Discipleship Central that hopefully will help them to get envisioned properly mm -hmm. for what we're talking about when we talk about discipleship. I think one of the things, too, for me that, that fueled the conviction to actually build this was what I realized time and time again in a number of those discussions was that what people were actually looking for, and it really let me know what their perspective of discipleship was and what their understanding of it was, what they were really looking for was curriculum. Mm -hmm. And it's a subtle mistake that that's made often is that it's the curriculum is the secret sauce. Mm -hmm. When in reality, it's just, it's a part of the process, but the process in and of itself, it's so much bigger and more critical. Sure. The curriculum has to be right. I mean, Correct. doctrinally speaking, it's, it has to be right. But the philosophy is so, so, so important and people can't miss it because ultimately what we're asking people to learn how to do is share life in a way that produces what Christ produced in the 12. Yes. Which is no easy task. No. So to assume that just because you got a skinny little book and you can op flop it open and yeah. sit down with someone, suppose that that's going to somehow produce Christ in them, that's not necessarily true. And so we just want to make sure that people have a full scope view of what it costs you as a discipler and costs the person who's going through discipleship. Yeah, I, I think it's subtle, but I, I think if discipleship is curriculum driven, then without meaning to, we take an academic scholarship approach that is pharisaical, mm -hmm. where ultimately we're concerned with what people know. Yeah. Again, I'm I'm not I'm not diminishing knowledge. I it's it's very very much a part of the process mm -hmm. because of the emphasis that we have to give to teaching. We yeah. can't make disciples without teaching the word of God and ultimately seeing the disciple established in it. Mm -hmm. But if it only if it starts and stops there, then we've not made a disciple indeed. We've just basically made a smart person. Right. Which that in and of itself you get into issues like Corinth and being puffed up with mm -hmm. knowledge and things like that, and that's grievous to the Lord. Well, what we often talk about in the Bible Institute and among the churches in the fellowship is this Second Peter chapter 1 a concept that you actually add to your faith, virtue. Yes. And so virtue is uh, the divine impression, the power of Christ in you. Yeah. And so when, when we're talking about adding to faith virtue, what we're talking about is integrating... Um, the the faith um, and the works and the mindset and the love and the passion associated with being in proximity to Jesus Christ. So you believe in Jesus, but now you become the friend of Jesus mm -hmm. and you live in light of your proximity to him and the intimacy that you share with him. And from that position, you're actually very, it's very easy for you to receive knowledge. Correct. But to, to, to put knowledge before virtue actually interrupts one's ability to receive in a genuine and meaningful way the value of Scripture and the, and the meaning that it holds. Um, and you can get puffed up, is, is what you were just saying. What you just presented, I, I think it takes us right back to where we started in, in John chapter 8 and verse 31, where Jesus uses the personal pronoun, my. Hmm. You continue, he didn't say if you continue in the word. Yes. You continue in my word. It's mm. personal. Yeah. So even the the knowledge, and, and again, now we get into to Matthew 11, you know, down mm. there, like verses 28 through 30, where Jesus says, you know, it's learn of me. Right. Not learn about me, but learn of me. It's very personal, even the Great Commission of in, in and of itself. And lo, I am with you. The, you know, so this this whole thing, it, it's, it's discipleship happens, true discipleship happens in the context of personal intimacy with Christ. Mm -hmm. 
and, and it far exceeds academia. Yeah. It's it's rich, it's life changing, it's John fifteen, it's abiding, it's yeah. and so that's the discipleship that we're after. That's what a disciple indeed that that's where it goes down. That's what it looks like. Yeah, great summary. Mm -hmm. And so with that, we we created a website that mm -hmm. is one part brochure. Yes. You know, when someone engages with it, it's an explanation of what we're talking about when we say discipleship. It's an introduction to some of the concepts and, and to our beliefs. You know, what are the beliefs that we hold? Mm -hmm. um, but then what we do is we invite pastors to join us in a series of modules. We refer them Correct. To, to, to them as modules, mm -hmm. but, but they're instructive classes that have kind of a, a watch and respond quality to them. Yeah. We'll take them through this course of study that ultimately prepares them, shows them that there's value in the cost of discipleship, and that it's something that their church actually needs if uh, they're going to grow deeper. What they're pursuing is going to be sustainable and have longevity over right. time, right? Uh, and so uh, tell us a little bit what people might expect when they visit the website beyond that. Like when they come there, there's a lot of different things happening. Mm -hmm. uh, and I do want you to explain also the way the modules work and, sure. and things like that. We've got a number of, of resources and tools that we believe will be helpful. We've got everything from blog posts to we've got our discipleship curriculum on there. Uh, we'll have our uh, cost of discipleship curriculum on there, which we'll, we'll, we'll talk about mm -hmm. with the, the training modules. Uh, we've got testimonies on there in terms of for, for pastors and leaders. People can actually read and see just the yeah. impact, the fruit of discipleship and to just to hear personal stories of how discipleship has changed people's lives. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll have uh, a message uh, archive where we've got everything from interviews with pastors on discipleship, many from this very show, mm -hmm. The Postscript. You, you've you talked to a number of pastors about discipleship who have, they've given invaluable contributions in those discussions mm -hmm. right here on The Postscript. And then just from some of the conferences that we've had, particularly the discipleship conference that we have every year as a fellowship in Cartersville, Georgia with Oakland Heights Baptist Church. And so we, we've got a number of, of, of tools, and, and, and we've got teaching helps for disciplers who will be discipling others mm -hmm. uh, to help them to navigate and use that material as best as, as they can. So we'll, we'll have enough to, to keep people going uh, on a regular basis. Tons, tons of resources tons for of people resources. who are at Absolutely. every stage of their yeah. discipleship journey, the yeah. investment that they make, whether they're a new disciple maker or they've been doing it for years. There's Absolutely. gonna be stuff for people there. Yeah. Absolutely. So th that's kind of what you can expect. And you know, we, we've got a team of, of folks that are, I, I think, are ready to keep it going. And I'm excited to work with them to keep it going. And obviously, you're a part of that too. So, so yeah. tell us a little bit. Say a pastor signs up. They're like, okay, yeah. I need to learn more about this. This. There's no pressure. None. Um, but uh, they sign up. What should they expect next? What what comes of that after they've signed up, what happens? So what you're referring to now in terms of them signing up, so everything that we've talked about so far is open and you can go and you can yeah, look free. at that and experience that however you want. But then now when we get into, I would say, the the crux of, of the site where we're now talking about the training modules, that's a little bit more involved, not much, but a little bit more mm -hmm. involved where you sign up and you can anticipate a response from us within 48 hours. And so what we're looking to do is just get you set up and get you cleared to move forward with the training modules. So we'll, we'll get you clearance and that gives you access to the videos and then the videos from there when you watch those, there are some assessments that we've built in to help you process the material as, as, as useful as possible. Um, so the videos in themselves for each module, you know, each module you're going to have at least two videos to support that module, sometimes mm -hmm. three. Those videos on average are about 25 minutes in length. And so after each one, there'll be an assessment for you to, 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 to work through. Now, one of the things I would like to say is that those assessments are really designed to help you work through some, some critical questions. Yeah. That if you don't work through, will be problematic for you later mm -hmm. in terms of why isn't this happening or why isn't this working like I thought? Well, because we missed a step. Mm -hmm. It was important for you to actually, even if it takes a week or two, 
to work through all of that before you go to the next video is yeah. actually worth it. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I think one of the things that we we try to do when when you were developing the questions, the, one of the objectives was that a pastor or leader would have the ability to kind of diagnose the state of discipleship Absolutely. that they're coming from. Yes both biblically and in life, that until we have a proper diagnosis, we can't actually ap apply a proper treatment. Right. And so the summative, the whole of the modules at the end is going to produce an opportunity for deeper and more meaningful application. Right. And, and so there'll be a treatment. They'll be like, okay, so this is what we think that you need to do to move forward. If those, those questions are honestly answered, right. it will interrupt our ability to help the church and for them to actually be helped. Absolutely. Hi, my name is Kale Horvath. I'm a missionary and church planter in Budapest, Hungary, and the host of Missionary Roundtable, the podcast. I'm super thankful for Living Faith Bible Institute. I graduated from there in 2017 and took as many classes as I could because it was just wonderful to be able to gather all of the Bible curriculum and all of the important studies that I needed to be able to go into ministry, but also learning from pastors and shepherds who were using their knowledge and expertise in the field and not just professing about it. Incredibly thankful for everything that I learned from practical missions, knowledge, all the way to deep theological studies like eschatology and prophecy in the Bible. Definitely, definitely something that you need if you want to serve the Lord in ministry. You need to have a solid uh, biblical knowledge, but you also need to know how to do ministry. And what better way to do that than to learn from people who are actually doing the ministry. For more information, check out lfbi.org. One of the things that we ask in the assessment piece, you know, of this first module is we want pastors and leaders to actually take the temperature of evangelism in their church. Mm -hmm. What's the temperature? Is it hot? Is it is it is it not? Where where is it? Because that's going to tell you where you are mm -hmm. with discipleship. Mm -hmm. This is also, you know, again, you asked earlier what what led to the development of discipleship central. And that's one of the things I remember very clearly in having a number of conversations with, with, with churches and, and pastors in particular. The one that, that really, I guess, was kind of a, a, a catalyst for me in all of this was, was hearing pastors say, we need to get discipleship going again. Mm -hmm. I would probe a little bit and start, and what I'm, what I'm asking for now is, what I'm looking to gauge is, what's the temperature of evangelism? Because if you're going to restart discipleship, hopefully that's because you won people to Christ and you mm -hmm. realize, oh, wait a minute, we need to have a discipleship structure in place to actually disciple these folks. That's great. Mm -hmm. But if it's, well, the church is not doing that great and we're not healthy and we need discipleship, well, mm -hmm. I, I'm not sure what you do with that right. unless what that looks like is... Uh, do you have any help or any any uh, advice for how we can evangelize our community? Right, uh, that's yeah. great. We can have that conversation. Right? Sure, sure. But um, but yeah, that that's very 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 critical in terms of taking the temperature of evangelism in your mm -hmm. church. That's that's huge. As they work through the modules, what else do they expect? I mean, what else is going to be presented to them um, as they as they progress through the training? Sure. So we go from discipleship one on one, understanding discipleship to discipleship one hundred two, and again, we we wanted to to give these um, titles to the modules to to be consistent with LFBI because. Mm -hmm. Decentral is a ministry of of the Living Faith Bible Institute. Right. So 102, we we now talk about the cost of discipleship, mm -hmm. where we're looking to to make a case for that in terms of what the cost of discipleship is and why we believe it's a critical piece to your discipleship ministry. Mm -hmm. And so for me personally, you know, there are parts of that where I do get very personal in terms of my experience and my observation and what led to that becoming a prerequisite for discipleship in our environment. Right. And for me, the prerequisite in terms of, of, of where that came in, into place and why we, we, we've taken that approach was because um, when it pleased the Lord to have me have responsibility 
for our discipleship ministry. And I took the temperature of discipleship in our local church at the time, which would have been around 2012. Mm -hmm. What I realized was about 70% of people who started discipleship in our local church didn't finish. Mm -hmm. And for the, mo for the most part, they would get to around less than four or five, and that was it. And so there was a, a discrepancy between what was being said from the pulpit and what people were hearing in the pews. Mm -hmm. So from the pulpit, we knew what we were saying. We knew what we meant when we beat the drum of discipleship. But what the people heard was, I think I can make it about four or five lessons and I'm done. <laughs> yeah. I mean, people were signing up and they, for all the right reasons... And then they were quitting for all the wrong ones. Yes. Because um, they hadn't fully grasped what it was going to take in terms of time, uh, uh, heart devotion, yes. uh, emotions, personal assessment, right. changes to their life. These are all things that people came to discover right. in the process of discipleship, discipleship instead of learning how to cast their nets down and commit on the front end. And really, that was harming our ministers, the, the people that were excited to invest right. their lives, and, to, and they were ready for this deep and meaningful friendship where they got to, to pray with and, and learn about this person, and they were going to teach them God's Word, right. and they were going to do ministry together. Like That's a huge commitment that we're asking our members to do. Cost of discipleship um, protects that relationship so that everyone enters into it on the right terms. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. And so... To, to your to your point, you know, I would say one of the biggest reckonings for those who started the process was what they realized was, oh, I didn't know that this was an accountable relationship. Mm. I didn't want that. Yeah. <laughs> and so to your point, you know, we we would exert so much time and effort to make these pairings and things like that. And the disciples who are willing and wanting to teach are heartbroken because this is not going to actually work. And so we decided, okay, you know what? Let's let's actually be biblical here and help people understand what this is and what they're saying they want to do. And I can only speak for our ministry here in Kansas City when I say that it's really been a game changer. It has flipped our discipleship quality on its head mm -hmm. because we went from having about 70% of people not finished to now well over that on yeah, average. Right, right. Well, I mean, well beyond 70% of people who start discipleship here. Mm -hmm actually finish and i would say about 95 percent of those folks move on into foundations two and three and then a great number of those folks actually move on into lfbi mm -hmm. if i can share this personal story with you very quickly sure. about about this uh we we had a, a pastor who was visiting with us during the week he came up he's a good friend of our pastor sam mm -hmm. And he's a local pastor here, and we were in the lobby with him, and, and we have in our lobby what we call the, the, the path of growth, where it, it outlines just what spiritual growth, the path, what it looks like at, at MBT, Midtown Baptist Temple. And we were talking about all that, and, and we got to LFBI, and he got really excited about that, and he was thinking about potentially how his people could could benefit from LFBI, which praise the Lord, if, mm -hmm. if, if we can be a blessing, we want to be to any church and anywhere. So we had that conversation for a bit, mainly him and our pastor Sam. But at one point I said, hey, I just want you to know what happens here, here being LFBI is actually decided here in the cost of discipleship. Sure. Yeah. They might not fully understand LFBI and what all that means, what all that looks like, but what happens in the cost of discipleship is that they decide that I'm in. Yeah. I'm in. Mm -hmm. I, I don't I don't care what, I don't care where, I don't care how, whatever, whenever, wherever, I am in. Right. And so what that looks like now is they start making decisions based on that, that mm -hmm. lead to foundations one, that leads to foundations two and three, and ultimately LFBI. And praise the Lord, now uh, many of these folks are working through the call of what it might look like to uproot their entire lives sure. and relocate around the yeah. globe. Yeah. But that all started in CLD. Yeah. And so what we do in the module in 102 is we present a 
philosophy of how to build an on-ramp to discipleship within a church. Hey, um, this is what it is. This is where we want to take mm-hmm. you. This is what growth looks like. So come join us. There's an on-ramp, but it also is a filtration system Yes, because what it does is it determines who uh, the believers are and who the disciples are. It, it distinguishes between those folks in your church and, and we... We want to make disciples, and we don't want there to be any illusion or, or confusion about what that means. Sure. So what about 103? So 103, we, we get into what we call the structure of mm-hmm. discipleship, and there there are, there are two primary emphases. Uh, the first is the arrangement. We talk about the arrangement. The arrangement being it's a teacher-student relationship. Mm. And it's important for us to understand that, that that is the arrangement of biblical discipleship. You see that with Christ, but not just with Christ. You see that with Moses and Joshua, Elisha, Elijah and Elisha, and you can mean Paul, Timothy and Titus. It's a, the teacher has to teach. They, mm-hmm. they have to fulfill that role and the student has to listen and follow. And so we, we build that out. But then from there, we, we, we talk about the arrangement, but we also talk about the approach. And the, the approach being one-on-one. So we, we look to bring biblical value, which you did in your opening, in terms of why we take a one-on-one approach. Mm-hmm. Again, not, we're not going to fight about it, but, but we make a very strong case for the, the plethora of benefits for one-on-one discipleship yeah. and how you're able to maximize that investment. I mean, it's game-changing. Yeah. You know, for, for so many people, I think it's important to understand that and this is something that we talk about from a training perspective here locally is that for so many people that land at our kitchen table in discipleship, this is the first healthy parent that they've ever had mm-hmm. because yeah, true. discipleship is so parental in scope, yeah. mm-hmm. right? I mean, you you are a spiritual father, you're a spiritual mother. And, and this is one of the biggest differences, and I, I won't go off here, but I do want to make this point. You know, one of the things that Paul talked about in First Corinthians is that you've got ten thousand instructors, but sure. you don't have any fathers. Yeah, you know, you you can get instructors online. You know, yeah, people love to geek out on their favorite Bible teacher on podcasts and whatnot, but that's not your father. No, you get fathers and mothers in the local church, mm-hmm. and that's what you get in a true discipleship environment. You get a spiritual mother. You get a spiritual father. That's invaluable. Yes who's going to sit down with you for a year and pour their life into you, right? So we, we talk about that approach and, and why that one-on-one approach is is the way to go. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so that's the structure. And, and then we from there in 104, we talk about um, uh, establishing a discipleship culture. What we're looking to do there is is make sure that everyone understands from a leadership perspective that discipleship is not something that's on the menu for the church. Mm-hmm. It is the menu. Yeah, it, it, It's the whole menu. Sure. <laughs> uh, from the nursery to the pulpit, we're all about being yeah. and making disciples indeed. It's the culture. Yeah. It's in, and it's and the thing that we we talk about in that in that module as well is that when it is the culture, it's not viewed as optional. Right. And I think that's very important, right? So when you, when you look at the very call, we're very careful to, to, to point out that it was that. It was a call. It was a command. It wasn't an invitation. Right. Because when you look at the call, you look at the command, it doesn't end with a question mark. It ends with a period. Sure. So I'm not asking you, yeah. will you follow me? Yeah. I'm commanding it. Yeah. So... In a discipleship culture, that's how the majority of the believers view it, Mm -hmm. is that the option to follow is not an option. Right. It's either obedience or it's disobedience. Uh, So, and then in 105, we actually get into the nitty gritty of implementation. Yeah. How do we now implement a biblical discipleship ministry structure in our local church that will basically position us to make disciples indeed over time. So as pastors are listening, what they're basically deciding is they're, they're learning. What, what are these things? Like, mm-hmm. what does this look like? You know, if I take this philosophical approach, what does it look like? But they're also deciding for themselves whether or not they're willing personally to pay the cost. Yeah. One of the things that churches have, they have their own culture, right? Like churches, 
they're long established. They have things that they do. They have, they have, you know, they pour energy into certain activities and, and work. Um, it might be the, the church choir is like really, really important in, in, mm-hmm. in our church. And this is a part of who we are. And, or uh, maybe it's uh, sports ministries or whatever it is. And, and none of these things are mutually exclusive. But my point is, is that a lot of churches have a lot of things going on. Right. And to say, well, we're going to take our best and brightest and they're going to start pouring into one-on-one relationships throughout the week. That might mean that a church has to divorce themselves from, from other cultural elements that don't serve into the Great Commission at the same level. In other words, they have to choose to prioritize, which is not an always, always an easy thing for no. a pastor to do. No, it's not. We're calling them to, to make big cultural decisions, big structural decisions that may even early on be very difficult. Yeah. But long term, the fruitfulness will prove itself out. Yes. And so, by the time they get to the end of this process, um, what happens? They finish that last module. Then what? Yeah. So let me. You said a lot there, mm-hmm. and if if I could respond to that, I think every church has to decide if they're going to be given to making church members or making disciples indeed. Mm -hmm. If you make disciples indeed, you'll get church members. Mm -hmm. But if you're making church members, you're not going to get disciples indeed out of that. When we make church members, that's where now we can load the church calendar up. We've got everything going on. We're in sports leagues. We're in bowling leagues. We're, uh, you name it. Yeah. Uh, I remember one church saying, hey, we've got over, we got almost 100 ministries in this church, and they were very proud of that. Mm-hmm. And it, well, again, that, that, that's great. The question becomes, are, are those disciples indeed? Yep. Right? So really, the, that, that fifth module, implementation, is going to, to essentially give you everything that you need to take off. Mm-hmm. And, and get going. Uh, one of the things that, that we're also going to have is uh, we're going to have quarterly webinars where pastors and leaders who have gone through these modules or are going through these modules will be able to jump on with us on one of our webinars, which mm-hmm. you've also been a part of with me in the past, mm-hmm. where we'll be able to talk discipleship. We'll be able to ask questions and even bounce things off of each other. Hey, I've learned some things, but I'm still learning some things about discipleship. So are you. We can all help one right. another. Right. But but we'll have that in place for pastors and leaders to participate in. It will only cost them time. Yep. And so that that will be there for them. Uh, we also have foundations two and three uh, mm-hmm. for pastors and leaders and and people in their churches who are looking to take the next step after foundations one. Uh, we've got the discipleship conference, so we we've got a number of things, and we'll have a number of things in place yeah. for pastors and teachers to build on after those five training modules. Uh, but then from there, we're also looking to add more training modules. But this first wave of of courses or mm-hmm. of modules are foundational. Yeah. And we've poured a lot of time and energy into building those and getting those off the ground. Right. That we believe is critical to anything that happens after that. I think it, what's really important, which we haven't said yet, is that none of this costs anybody anything except for the time itself. Time. Yeah. So so it, not only do the webinars don't they don't cost you anything, but the modules themselves, the training, it doesn't cost you anything. Um it doesn't really even cost you that much time. Mm-hmm. It's really, I mean, I think the main thing is that it actually, it, it's going to cost you things along the way that are philosophical. Yes. Like you're going to have to, you're going to have to be willing to lay some things down in order to pick some new things up. And, um, but again, there's no pressure. It's not a high pressure sales situation. We don't have any ulterior motives. Um, the, the main thing is that we just wanted to create something that allowed pastors to have easy access to the training, uh, that allowed us to follow up with pastors, um, uh, to have accountability right. within the network of, of, of local churches. This was uh, something that you did out of your love for mm-hmm. discipleship, not because we were looking to make disciples of us. We want to make disciples of Jesus. Yeah, no yeah. doubt about it. And we, we, we love our students. Mm-hmm. You know, We're grateful for every one of them. 
And one of the things that we wanted to do is we, we wanted to give them a platform that they could, they could essentially take with them. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of them, they're either going to, you know, bring support to a discipleship ministry that's happening in their local church, or they're actually going to have to implement one. Mm -hmm. And again, which is why that fifth module implementation, after we've, we've looked at the first four, okay, how do I put all this together? Right. Well, we're going to help you with that. But now they actually have the tools and resources that they need to actually not just implement it, but sustain it, mm -hmm. which I think is very critical. Mm -hmm. And so just by way of testimony, um, maybe you could share with us a little bit about what God's been doing, maybe just in Cottonwood, mm -hmm. Arizona, um, with the folks that we've been working with out there, and, and maybe just share with us that we are actually seeing God use the testimony of the fellowship, LFBI, and and just and our philosophy of discipleship. We're seeing it begin to impact other churches and affect the way in which they approach the people in their church. Yeah, uh, that's a that's an amazing testimony uh, to the faithfulness and and grace of the Lord. But we we had a a brother reach out to us that we didn't know, mm -hmm. uh, looking for help. You know, a, a, a man who had and has an appetite for the word of God, wants to grow, reached out and said, hey, I, I've come across you guys and I've never been discipled and I want to be. Yeah. And by the grace of God, we, we said, OK, let, we'll, we'll help. <laughs> and so we made some decisions to get him the support that he needed to get what he needed. And. That led to him getting formally discipled, but then that led to him actually being a student in our Bible Institute, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, which then led to us having a, a ministry door of investment that was presented to us uh, to minister in, in his local church. And yeah. so we've taken a number of trips out there now. Uh, a faithful man in our fellowship has taken the lead on that. Uh, he's led a few teams to help that church. They were there a few weeks ago where... They had about 40 people in the church actually come out to get training on how to evangelize. Mm -hmm. Again, just one-on-one -on -one yep. understanding, like it starts with evangelism. And so, and this was great. Not only did they get, you know, training on evangelism, but they actually hit the streets. Mm. And for a number of the folks in this church, they had never done that before. Right. They never shared the gospel. They never it? shared the gospel. Mm -hmm. They never engaged a lost person with the gospel. Well, many of them did that weekend. And so he was here actually with us this past weekend and, and got to share a testimony of just the, the impact that the Living Faith Fellowship has had on his life personally, but not just that, also his family. And then, of course, the church family yeah. there in Arizona. Yeah. But then there are other stories all, sure. all, all over the world of, of people who God has led to the Living Faith Bible Institute. And through that, they've become acquainted with the Living Faith Fellowship and have been able to glean from the postscript and some of our conferences that we do and obviously the Bible Institute to be able to help them grow, but not just them, but it's actually impacting their local churches. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we could probably spend another hour talking sure. about all the different stories, yeah. but that one's the most recent and probably yeah. the freshest. Yeah, yeah, no, it's amazing. And and. To point back to what you were sharing earlier about the health of a church being part of the assessment of of whether or not they actually have discipleship, um, the pastor of the church that we're talking yeah. about um, saw in this man yes. a distinct change. He, did. he saw yeah. a character change in him. And when he saw that character change, he was like, there's something to this discipleship thing that you're doing. Um, I've got to check it out. And so right. the next thing he did is he went to discipleship conference. Yeah. And then he got a taste of, from the whole fellowship of what discipleship truly is. And then with just within a year, a complete um, shift in the philosophy of their ministry, and they're really begin, beginning to see the impact of that. And so it's it's all glory to God. We're thankful for an opportunity to lend a hand, right. um, and that's all Discipleship Central is. And so as we, as we close, um, maybe just give a, a very formal invitation maybe yeah. to people join us on Discipleship Central? You know, whether it be LFBI or Discipleship Central, uh, our focus, we aren't looking to cause problems in your church. We're not looking to sow discord. We're not looking to sheep still. 
No. Not at all. <laughs> uh, we're in it because, uh, to your point, we, we believe it deeply. Mm -hmm. And if, if God has been good to us, and he has been, and he's shown us some things, if, if we can be a blessing and a help, we want to be. Yeah. That's all we want. Yep. And so to anyone out there that has been grappling with, because that, that's the thing I've sensed so many times in talking with pastors and leaders about this, is I sense a frustration. I sense, I don't want to say desperation, but but there's like this, it's just like they're, they're trying to figure it out. What do I do? How does this work? Well, that's, that's why we're here. Mm -hmm. we're, we're, we're here hopefully to simplify that for you. And for me, I I envision like maybe there's a pastor and maybe his whole team and as a staff they devote maybe a few hours to this or an, you know an hour uh, it, to to sit down together and and watch these videos and have conversations mm -hmm. and work through the assessment and and just start building from there. Mm -hmm. And they get to that fifth one where now they're ready to implement it and they have. You know, from a vision perspective, I think there's something that you you should get from this, and it is what I would call discipleship clarity. Mm. Like it's clear. Yeah, it's not ambiguous anymore. It's not vague. It's not mysterious or subjective. Like, okay, I get it. I see mm -hmm. it. Not because of what that guy on the screen is saying, but I see it biblically. Right. There it is. Yeah, and I know how to implement this and know how to sustain it. And I get excited just thinking about, because I know what happens when you implement a biblical philosophy of discipleship in a local church. Mm -hmm. I know what happens. Mm -hmm. But I do think that one of the things I think we have to divorce ourselves from is, is uh, I would say, are these instant expectations like we talked about earlier a little bit, where this isn't like... It's microwavable. Yeah. yeah. We're, we're, this isn't Roman noodles. Yeah, you know, right. Ramen, sorry. Yeah. If my daughter heard that, she'd go, Dad said Roman noodles. <laughs> <laughs> Ramen noodles, uh -huh. right? Where you're going to heat up water and then three minutes later you got... Right. No, it, it, this takes time. Yeah. But it's, I would say this, a biblical discipleship investment in a local church is the greatest investment that we can make. Yeah. And so please come. If we can help, we'd love to. Yeah. Well, Kenny, thank you for all your hard work that you've put into Discipleship Central and the modules and the teaching and the follow-ups with pastors over the years. And and I know there's churches in the fellowship where the pastors are doing the same thing. They're, they're fielding all these inquiries yeah. about discipleship. And uh, if this can be a tool to you uh, to save you time and energy and, and be efficient in, in your investment, we, we would love that as well. So, man, thank you so much for sharing with us today about Discipleship Central. It means a lot, and, and I'm praying that it'll have a long-term effect uh, on churches all over the U.S. And, and all over the world. Praise the Lord, man. Humbled. Thanks for having yeah. me. Absolutely. Yeah, so. And we want to thank you for joining us, hanging out with me and Kenny as we chat about ministry. It's something we love to do. Uh, it's only uh, a greater benefit when we can share that with you uh, on the postscript. And so uh, we're glad that you joined us, but we also want to invite you, invite you to check out Discipleship Central, invite you to uh, check out lfbi.org and, and learn about the Living Faith Bible Institute and how you can grow in your personal faith and, and in your knowledge of God's Word and, and your wisdom to implement uh, in ministry and into the lives of other people. Uh, but we want to also invite you to talk with your pastors about uh, discipleship and, and, its, and its necessary um, life-giving uh, effect on local churches and what you've heard today. We want to invite you to go deeper in ministry in your local church. We want to invite you to have a more serious prayer life. Are you praying for your pastors? There's so many things that I'm thinking about that come out of, of an interview like this that should be a challenge to us and in terms of how we see the ministry and God's work within the local church. Uh, what part do you play is the question. And so whatever it is that you need to do and whatever it is that you're convicted about, we want to invite you to do that and to proceed according to faith. But we love you, and we're so grateful for the time that you spent with us today. It means so much to, um, to us, and, and we love to hear about uh, uh, your favorite episodes and and what it is you're listening to. We love it when you share the episodes with other people and, and leave reviews. It means a lot to us, and, and we're grateful for, for all that you've invested in into the show. But we are excited that you were with us this week, and we're excited to see you again next week for another episode of The Postscript. God bless. Thanks for listening to The Postscript. 
If you enjoy the show, please leave us a rating and review in order to help other people find our podcast. If you value this show, please help us continue creating content by supporting Living Faith Bible Institute at lfbi.org support.